Hello, and thank you to the organizers of the seminar for the in invitation to speak. I'm Thomas Kindred from uh, the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, and I'm going to be speaking today about uh, geometric aspects of some old conjectures of Peter Guthrie Tate. To start the historical background for this talk, I want to introduce uh, two very old problems. Um, the first is a series of conjectures uh, that Tate made in the uh, late 1800s when he was uh, attempting to tabulate the knots uh, motivated by the mistaken belief that uh, atoms uh, were uh, vortices in the ether. And so eventually, of course, we discovered that there is no ether and there are no vortices, uh, but we found other good reasons to study knots, which bring us here today. Uh, but Tate's conjectures uh, turned out to be true, but also turned out to be very difficult to prove. In fact, it took almost 100 years to prove them. Uh, and there was very little progress. Uh, they were unproven until uh, the Jones polynomial was discovered in the 80s. And the conjectures are all about alternating knot diagrams, um, in large part because the, the first many knots in the knot table are alternating. Um, and empirically, Tate uh, made the following conjectures. The first was that if you have an alternating diagram with no kinks in it, so it's a reduced diagram, and if the knot that it represents is not a connected sum, meaning that uh, this, this turns out to be equivalent to the condition that your alternating diagram can't be split up as a diagrammatic connect sum in this way. So if you have a alternating diagram with no kinks and the underlying knot is prime, then the first conjecture is that that diagram has the smallest number of crossings and any other diagram of the same knot has the same number of crossings, any other alternating, reduced alternating diagram. The second conjecture is that all alternating diagrams, reduced alternating diagrams of a given prime knot have the same writhe, where the writhe is the number of positive crossings minus the number of negative crossings, uh, where this depends on an arbitrary choice of orientation on the knot, although of course, um, either choice of orientation for the knot gives the, the same writhe. Uh, throughout, I'm gonna be talking about knots. Um, everything that I say in this talk will apply to links, uh, but with qualifications. Um, occasionally I'll mention them. Uh, for example, here, the writhe is an invariant uh, of an oriented link. Um, it does matter what the relative orientations on the, the link components are. And the third conjecture that Tate made was that all reduced alternating diagrams of a given prime knot are related by a particular type of move that he calls a flipe. And what a flipe involves is splitting your diagram into two pieces that are almost separate and have one crossing in between. And so this is the, this is the general uh, situation right here. And what you can imagine is taking this tangled T2 and flipping it over. That's where the name comes from. And when you flip that over, the whole tangle gets flipped and the crossing that was over here gets moved to the other side of the tangle. And on the right-hand side, we have an example of a flight move on the 6-3 knot. And the point is that this crossing right here gets moved down there. All right, so, so these problems remained open for almost 100 years. And as they seemed particularly uh, both believable but also difficult, Fox, Ralph Fox asked the question uh, in the 50s or 60s, what is an alternating knot? Now, an alternating knot is a knot with an alternating diagram, meaning that as you walk along the knot, it alternates over, under, over, under. But what Fox meant was, topologically, what is an alternating knot? In particular, does the exterior of an alternating knot have, does the space around an alternating knot have properties uh, that make alternating knots special? And if so, how can we characterize them? And that question too remained open for quite a long time, 
um, and was solved recently independently by Howie and Green. And so I'm gonna go into more detail about all of this uh, during the talk. But first I wanna say uh, the Tate conjectures were proven using the Jones polynomial uh, between it in the decade after its discovery. And the first Tate conjecture that alternating reduced alternating diagrams minimize crossings is probably the one that follows most beautifully from the Jones polynomial. And the idea is very simple. It's that if you have any diagram and you compute the Jones polynomial from it, the degree span is gonna be at most the number of crossings that you have in that diagram. And this is true for any diagram. But if you have an alternating diagram, reduced alternating, then the degree span equals the number of crossings. And so the point is that, uh, for example, in the case of the trefoil, the degree span of the Jones polynomial is three. Therefore, there can be no diagrams with fewer than three crossings. But the alternating diagram has three crossings. Therefore, it's minimal. And this argument holds in general um, for any alternating, reduced alternating diagram. One immediately implies two using properties of the not signature, which I'll discuss more in detail as this talk goes on. Um, and, the, and so the Jones polynomial together with these properties of the not signature um, give this very nice, elegant um, and relatively simple proof of, of Tate's first two conjectures. The Fleipin conjecture, however, seems to be a little bit harder, um, at least in terms of proving it just using the Jones polynomial. And the proof of that uh, came a few years later in 1993. Um, and it involved mainly geometric techniques together with an assist from the Jones polynomial. And the use of the Jones polynomial in the proof of the Fleipin theorem given by Manasco and Thistlethwaite in 1993 came from the fact that if you reverse one crossing in an alternating diagram, and if the resulting knot happens to still be alternating, then its crossing number is at most the original crossing number minus two. And so while their original flavor, while their original proof was mainly geometric, uh, it certainly did rely on uh, the Jones polynomial. And so, we're confronted with a situation where these very old problems remained open for almost a hundred years. Jones polynomial has an elegant, leads to an elegant proof of the first two and together with substantial additional work leads to a proof of the last one. And so then the question becomes, well, what does this mean geometrically? Why is the Jones polynomial solving this? Or can we understand why these are true without using the Jones polynomial? And these are related questions. If we can understand geometrically what's going on with these conjectures, now theorems, perhaps that'll shed light on the geometric content of the Fleiping or of the Jones polynomial, which remains um, an active and vibrant area of, of inquiry in many directions. Um, let me also note that the Fleiping theorem immediately implies the first two Tate conjectures because flights preserve the number of crossings and rive. Actually, that's not quite true. So it is true that the Fleiping theorem implies the second Tate conjecture, and it implies part of the first Tate conjecture. It implies that all reduced alternating diagrams have the same number of crossings, but it does not imply that that number is minimal because for that you need to consider what about non-alternating diagrams of an alternating knot. And we'll come back to all of these uh, points as we continue through the talk. Regarding Fox's question and geometric uh, proofs of Tate's conjectures, the first progress in this direction came uh, just three or four years ago. Uh, first, uh, Howie and Green independently answered Fox's question by characterizing alternating knots and links um, topologically, both in terms of checkerboard or chessboard surfaces uh, from diagrams of that link. 
So Howie proved that a knot is alternating if and only if it has a pair of spanning surfaces whose, sum, whose complexities, and I'll be uh, reviewing all of these uh, in just a moment, um, but the first Betty number is the rank of the first homology. And if the sum, and it measures the complexity of the spanning surface, if the sum of those numbers is half the difference in the boundary slopes, then it turns out that those surfaces can be realized as chessboard surfaces from an alternating diagram, and in particular that the knot is alternating. And uh, with a, a little additional care, uh, Howie's characterization also extends to links. Green proved similarly that a link or knot is alternating if and only if it has a positive definite spanning surface and a negative definite spanning surface. And I'll be using this at length and describing what these mean shortly. Uh, and I will also mention as we go through this that Green's uh, characterization holds not just for knots in the three sphere, um, but in a, in a more general context. Green also used his characterization to give the first proof of, first geometric proof of part of Tate's conjectures. He used his characterization of alternating links together with lattice flows on the Tate graphs for the chessboard surfaces to prove the second Tate conjecture that the writhes are equal and part of the first Tate conjecture, namely that crossing number is always equal for all reduced alternating diagrams of the link. But he didn't prove that that's minimal. And again, we'll come back to this later. Okay, so at the end of the talk, we're going to discuss related open problems. Here's a plan for the talk. Uh, I'm gonna begin with some background, uh, starting with uh, how knot diagrams correspond to spanning surfaces, in particular chessboard surfaces. If you have a surface, you want to have uh, some numbers associated with it and other algebraic objects uh, that characterize its topology. In particular, the Betty number and the slope we'll discuss. We'll also discuss the signature and the Gordon Litherland pairing, uh, which connects several of the, these ideas and is how we define definite surfaces, leading to uh, a more precise statement of Green's characterization. Then I'm going to be talking about plumbing and replumbing operations on spanning surfaces. And this is the main uh, geometric tool that I'm going to use to give the first geometric proof of the Flyping theorem. As I go through this, first I'll tell you what these moves are. Then as a short aside, I'm going to talk about uh, how essential surfaces behave under plumbing. Uh, there's a theorem of goodbye later extended by Ozawa. Um, and I will show that uh, in, in a sense, uh, this doesn't extend in, in a geometric context. Um, then back to, back to the, main, the main content, I'll talk about how flyping can be seen as a replumbing operation on spanning surfaces. And then I'll briefly introduce uh, another main tool that I'll use in my geometric proof of the flyping theorem. And I'll talk about what we can say about definite surfaces in particular when we replumb them. At this point, we'll have all of the tools and we can just write down the Flyping theorem. And at the end, I'll talk about related problems, parts of Tate's conjectures that are unproven by geometric means. Of course, they are all proven in general uh, and related problems similar in flavor to Tate's theorems, which also, although proven, remain unproven by purely geometric means. Okay, what is a spanning surface? A spanning surface is a surface whose boundary is a given knot or link. Now, throughout this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on alternating diagrams, alternating links, specifically reduced ones. And so throughout, we'll set the convention that D and D prime will be reduced alternating diagrams on a sphere of a prime alternating knot. Um, and new will denote a closed regular neighborhood. OK, what is a spanning surface? It's a surface whose boundary is a given knot or link. And sometimes it's convenient uh, to think of the spanning surface instead of being an embedded surface with boundary in the three sphere, instead to think of it as being a properly embedded surface in the knot exterior. And the extra condition uh, 
is that its boundary needs to each intersect each meridian transversely in a single point. Um, we also require that a spanning surface be connected um, and compact, but we do not require that it's orientable. So uh, an orientable surface, orientable spanning surface is called a cipher surface, but we certainly allow non-orientable spanning surfaces as well because from a given knot diagram, most of our chessboard surfaces are gonna be non-orientable. Okay, so the first, the first invariant uh, of a spanning surface is its first Betty number, which is the rank of its first homology group. It measures how many holes there are in the surface. Uh, and another convenient way to think of it is how many times you need to cut your surface along properly embedded arcs in order to reduce it to a disc. And so in this example shown on the right, there are two holes in the surface. You can pinch through, there's kind of, there's a bridge. So you can kind of go under the bridge right here. So that's one hole. And then there's another hole right there. So there's two holes in the surface. Um, the Betty number is two. And another way to see this is that there are two arcs that if you cut along those two arcs, you get a disc. And this number is independent of the choice of arcs. So if you have any collection of arcs in your surface such that cutting them gives you a disc, there are always gonna be two arcs for this surface. Okay. Most of the spanning surfaces that I'll be discussing are chessboard surfaces from diagrams. So what do you do? You color in the diagram. So this is gonna be, this is gonna give one surface. So I have three disks that I just colored in. And then I'm gonna connect those disks with half twisted bands at the crossings. And then the other two regions on the sphere, we're gonna color in with two disks and connect those also with half twist bands at the crossings. And so then you have these two surfaces, a black surface and a white surface spanning your knot. And these surfaces mostly live in the sphere, except near the crossings, they twist and they intersect at a vertical crossing. And so uh, this is a top view and this is a side view. And the point is that this yellow arc here uh, is where the surfaces intersect at a crossing. And at the very end, I'm gonna talk about uh, thinking about these, geom these vertical arcs together with and a little bit more geometrically, particularly in the context of flipping. Okay. So the next thing that we wanna do on a spanning surface, several things that we'll do uh, can be understood in terms of what's called the gordon litherland pairing. So what do you do? You take your surface and you thicken it up. And then given any oriented simple closed curve on your surface, you can lift it to the boundary of the thickened up surface and give those the same orientation. And that's shown right here. The original part of the original curve is in red and you can see there's two copies of it in orange. Now, if your original curve has a twisted neighborhood, a Mobius band neighborhood, then these orange curves are actually going to be a single curve. Whereas if uh, you're your red curve has an annular neighborhood, the two orange curves uh, coming from it are going to be distinct. In any case, you can use this setup to define a symmetric bilinear pairing on the first homology groups of your surface, where given any two homology classes, you take representatives and you take the linking number of one of them with this lift of the other one. And it's not too hard to show, as Gordon Litherland do, that, that this is actually symmetric. Um, it involves uh, perturbing. Um, it, it involves perturbing the uh, the lifted curves. Um, and the geometric meaning of this is easiest to see in the case of a self pairing of a curve with itself. So if you have a simple closed curve in your surface, then its framing is half of the self pairing. And this is probably easiest to understand with some examples. So let's start with this example on the left. 
the black surface, it has a single uh, generator of its homology, which is the red curve. And that curve twists in a positive way. And there are three half twists, one at each crossing. And so the red curve framing is three halves because there's three positive half twists. And so it's self pairing, as you can uh, represented by this is called a Guritz matrix. Uh, the self pairing is three. The white surface, its homology uh, has rank two. And so you can take the green and purple curves to be generators. Each of those green and purple curves has an annular neighborhood that consists of two negative half twists. And so the green and purple curves have framing two times negative a half or negative one, which again is half of the self pairing that you can read off of the Gerritz matrix. Similarly, if we look at this uh, spanning surface for the 6-3 knot, there are three generators for homology. They each have positive, uh, positively twisted neighborhoods. The red one has an annular neighborhood consisting of one twist, framing positive one. The green and the purple have Mobius band neighborhoods framing positive three halves. And so as you look at this, you might notice that it seems like everything in uh, this chessboard surface from an alternating diagram, well, the black surface, everything seems to be twisting in a positive way. And in fact, that's the point of Green's characterization, which we'll get to shortly. But first, I want to talk about the boundary slope. And there are several ways to define this. One is, OK, you have a spanning surface. One thing you can do is you can adjust your spanning surface along its interior into the four ball. So the point is that S3 is the boundary of the four ball. And your knot sits in S3. So you can fix the knot in S3, but push the interior of the surface into the four ball. And then you can take a self-intersection number, an algebraic self-intersection number. And so when you perturb your surface, it's going to generically have uh, single uh, singletons of self-intersection. Each of them has a positive or negative sign. So you get an algebraic self-intersection number. And that self-intersection number is the Euler number of this properly embedded surface in the four ball. And that Euler number actually can be computed um, from the gordon litherland pairing. And here the formula is for an arbitrary link with any number of components. We'll mainly be focusing on the case where we have a knot. Um, but, and I'll give a, a simpler formulation of, of what the, the boundary slope is in that case. Um, so what we'll call the negative of the Euler number, the slope of the surface. Um, and so in this example shown on the right, the white surface has slope zero. And the reason for that is that its boundary is zero in homology because it bounds, well, because the white surface is orientable. Therefore, uh, well, the, the boundary is zero. And so the self pairing is zero. And so the slope is zero using this formula. For the black surface, the boundary is this curve in yellow, which is homologous to two times the core curve, which is shown in red. And so if you take the self pairing of the boundary of the black surface and multiply by a half to get the framing, then you can use the fact that the self pairing of this generator is three and you get that the slope is six. Okay, so there's this thing happening with the four ball, which is actually gonna be sometimes convenient. We'll come back to it uh, when it's convenient. Um, but first, uh, just a simpler and more conventional way to define the boundary slope of a spanning surface for a knot is, okay, you just take your knot and you push it into uh, the surface. And then you just take the linking number of your original knot and its push off. And that equals the framing of the knot in the surface, which is why this is the same as what we did on the last slide. The signature of a surface denoted by sigma is the signature of the linking pairing or of the Gordon-Litherland pairing on the surface where 
the signature of a pairing or a signature of a matrix is the number of positive eigenvalues minus the number of negative eigenvalues. Notice that the pairing is symmetric. And so by the spectral theorem, all of your eigenvalues are real. Now it's possible that you could have zero as an eigenvalue, in which case it's either neither added nor subtracted. Um, but because it's symmetric, it's, um, and this is a sensible thing to pay attention to. And Gordon Litherland, in a beautiful paper uh, from the 70s, I want to say the late 70s, uh, discuss um, how to think about the signature. And uh, their work actually underlies um, Green's characterization. In particular, they show that no matter what spanning surface you take for your knot, if you take its signature and adjust by its boundary slope, that quantity is independent of the surface. It only depends on the knot. And when you have a knot, this quantity is the knot signature. Um, in the case of a link, the same thing is true, uh, except that the signature is an oriented link invariant. And so instead of uh, this quantity equaling the knot signature, it equals the Mursugi invariant uh, psi of L. OK. But, but in the case of a knot, uh, this adjusted signature of the surface equals the signature of the knot. And so, uh, for example, we can uh, look at the two, bl the black and white surfaces um, from this picture. And we already calculated their slopes. This one was zero, the black one was six. And well, turns out that uh, the signature of the black surface, well, it's only got a single generator um, and it's positive. So that's clearly one. And so that allows us to calculate the signature. And if you calculate the signature of the white surface using the matrix um, from a couple slides ago, that turns out to be negative two. More on that in a moment. And so you get the same answer, which, well, we, we know we get the same answer. OK. So now we have all the tools to say what Green's characterization was. What is a definite surface? A positive definite surface is a surface whose Gordon Litherland pairing is positive definite, meaning that any non zero homology class paired with itself gives you a positive number. Well, the signature of the pairing is at most the size of the matrix. And the size of the matrix is the rank of the homology, the first homology group, which is the Betty number. And so your surface is positive definite if and only if its signature is the first Betty number. Now, we're interested in thinking about things geometrically in this talk. And so uh, it's worth noting the, that this positive definite um, that a surface is positive definite if and only if it satisfies the following geometric condition, which is that every simple closed curve in the surface should either have a positive framing, and this sounds just like what was going on uh, with our chessboard surfaces, or the other possibility is maybe it bounds an orientable subsurface. In particular, if you have a ciphered surface, the boundary slope is going to be zero, the framing along the boundary is going to be zero. That's OK. Anytime you've got a curve that bounds an orientable subsurface, its framing is always going to be zero. But as long as that's not the case, positive definite means that the framing is positive. Negative definite is defined analogously. Um, all self pairings of non zero homology classes are negative. The signature should be the negative of the first Betty number. And likewise, switch positive to negative in the geometric. Uh, description of what this means. OK, Green characterizes what an alternating knot is in, you could say, in two steps. And the first is, let's still focus on the diagram. And so what is what is what what can we say about the topological content of an alternating knot diagram? Well, Green shows that a connected link diagram, more generally, or in particular a knot diagram, is alternating if and only if its two chessboard surfaces are a positive definite surface and a negative definite surface. But then what's really amazing is turns out that any positive definite spanning surface 
in any negative definite spanning surface, given to that pair of surfaces, it's possible to isotop them so that they become the chessboard surfaces for an alternating diagram. And Green actually proves that this is true not only for links in the three sphere, but in fact, that if you have a link in a Z mod two homology sphere with a positive definite and negative definite spanning surface, which by the way, defining that takes a little additional work, um, but it all goes the same way as what Gordon and Litherland do. If you've got a link in a Z mod two homology sphere with these two surfaces, turns out that, they, that the link must actually be in S3. And again, the surfaces can be realized as chessboard surfaces for an alternating diagram. And moreover, that diagram is reduced if and only if there's no homology class with self-pairing plus or minus one. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about positive and negative definite chessboard surfaces for the rest of the talk. There'll be a black surface and a white surface. And so I wanna set a convention and the convention is going to be that the black surfaces are always positive and the white surfaces are always negative. Okay. In, in the characterization, um, in the geometric proof of the Flyping theorem that I'll describe, uh, there are a couple of lemmas that I use that um, are about properties of definite surfaces. The first one follows immediately from properties of the signature and the definition of definite surfaces, which is that if you have a pair of positive and negative definite surfaces, that their slope difference is always equal to twice uh, the sum of their Betty numbers. Um, and then, and this follows immediately from, from, from uh, work of, of Green. With some additional work, um, I prove the following fact, which is, okay, so green proves that if you have a, a positive and negative definite surface, you can isotop them so that they're in nice form. You have a, you have a chessboard, they're the chessboard surfaces from an alternating diagram. And what I prove is actually, even if you don't isotop them, then they're still gonna intersect in a pretty nice way. So in particular, any arc where your positive and negative surface intersect, as long as your arc is not boundary parallel, what it really, what this says is any arc of intersection between these two surfaces looks like a crossing. And this will be useful later on. Okay. So the next thing I wanna introduce is what is an essential surface? What is this plumbing operation and how, and then I'll discuss how they, um, how they interact. Okay, so there's two traditional notions of essential surfaces. One notion is geometric. So a surface is geometrically essential if you can't simplify it with a compression move or a boundary compression move as shown here. And this boundary compression move that I've shown here is a little bit restricted compared to boundary compression in general. And, and I've restricted it in such a way that these are the types of boundary compressions that take a spanning surface to another spanning surface. In other words, a spanning surface is geometrically essential if it can't be simplified by a local operation uh, to give you a simpler spanning surface for the same knot. Okay, related notion says that your surface is essential if when you include it into the knot complement, uh, the induced map on fundamental groups is injective. Um, and then there's an exceptional case you need to mention, which is you also need to require that F is not a Mobius band spanning the unknot. In other words, it's not one of these, it's not this surface and it's not the mirror image. Okay, so these two, sur these two definitions are related. They're actually equal They're in the two-sided case, so for Seifert surfaces, um, the two notions of essential are the same. And, but for one-sided surfaces, they're not the same. And one is stronger, namely pi one essential implies geometrically essential, but not conversely. And we'll come back to this in a moment. Okay, the main uh, geometric content 
um, or insight uh, that goes into my proof of the Flyping theorem is has to do with plumbing, also called Murasugi sum, and an associated operation called replumbing. Okay, so how does this work? Well, if you've got a spanning surface like the one shown here in green and two shades of gray, then you can look for what I call a plumbing cap, which is a disc sitting outside the knot whose boundary lies on the surface. So the disc sits outside the surface. The boundary of the disc sits on the surface and hits the knot. And the boundary of this cap also bounds a disc in the surface. So this purple curve on the surface also bounds a green disc within the surface. And so I call that cap in purple, the plumbing cap, and I call the green disc in the surface its shadow. And so um, if you glue together two spanning surfaces along a disc in such a way that you could decompose it by such a cap, so the point is that this cap and shadow give you a two sphere, which cuts the three sphere into two balls, and each of those balls intersects your surface in a subsurface. And those subsurfaces are somehow the factors, the plumbing factors of your original one. Okay, so this is a plumbing decomposition. If we glued these two surfaces together to give this one, that's plumbing, generalized plumbing, also called Murasugi sum. And what I'm gonna be talking about most is a related operation called replumbing. Okay, so consider this surface right here. It's got this plumbing cap, what we can do is we can replace the shadow with the cap. So if we remove the green disc and we glue on the purple one, we get another spanning surface. And I call this operation replumbing. And notice that this same operation cannot in general be realized by an isotopy in S3, but it can be realized by a proper isotopy through the four ball. So what you can do is you can just take this green disc and push its interior into the four ball and then pass it through. And then once it's on the other side, you can push it back into the three sphere. And uh, I'll mention a significance. Uh, well, I'll mention it right now. The significance is that if you have a replumbing of a definite surface, you always have a definite surface because definiteness comes from the gordon litherland pairing, which can be understood completely in terms of what happens when you perturb the interior of your surface into the four ball. Okay. Classical theorem of Gabay from the 80s says that in the case of Seifert surfaces, plumbing or Murasugi sum preserves all of your favorite properties. Plumbing minimal genus surfaces gives you a minimal genus surface. Fibered surfaces, plumb to give you a fibered surface. Essential surfaces, plumb to give you essential surfaces. And um, in fact, all of this follows from a more general statement about uh, top foliations. Some of this makes no sense in the non-orientable setting, but at least the essential part and minimal genus part do. Now the minimal genus part is false for two for one-sided surfaces, but the essential part is actually true as long as you talk about pi one essential. So if you have two pi one essential surfaces and you glue them together in this type of way called plumbing, generalized plumbing or Murasugi sum, um, the resulting surface is always pi one essential and Ozawa proved this in 2011. And as just a brief aside, I wanna point out that the same result is not true for geometrically essential. So it's not immediately obvious that this surface is geometrically essential, but it is. And the point is that the closest you can get to a compressing disc is gonna have boundary running along the front of the surface like this, and then it's gonna run along the back of the surface like this. But the issue is that the boundary of this disc is gonna self-intersect. And so you can visualize this disc as there's a disc above the projection plane bounded by the red and the purple, a disc below bounded by the blue and the purple. The boundary of the disc is the red and the purple, but that, that uh, boundary of the disc self-intersects. and now it doesn't immediately follow that there's no other compressing disc, but you can prove that there's not. Okay, so this one is essential geometrically 
but not algebraically. Um, so again, the point is that the red and blue curve there actually is a curve that is non-trivial in the fundamental group of the surface, but is trivial in the fundamental group of the knot complement. Okay, so you've got this geometrically essential surface. And if you plumb on a Hopf band, you get this surface and that is geometrically compressible. And the point is that when you glue on the Hopf band, when you plumb it on in this way, you add this bridge right here and you avoid this self-intersection. Okay, so I just wanted to mention this as a brief aside, it's that plumbing and essential surfaces play well together, but you have to be careful. Okay, now, um, if some, so in a moment, I'm gonna to get to how this pertains to flyping, but first I wanna set up a little bit of uh, structure around these plumbing caps. So I wanna say, I wanna put a couple conditions on plumbing caps that I'll call acceptable and irreducible. Acceptable means there's no local way that you can simplify it. There, there are a couple types of arcs on its boundary that perhaps you could just get rid of with a simple isotopy. And I wanna assume that those don't exist. I also wanna assume that a plumbing cap is not reducible. So reducible looks like this. So this purple here is a plumbing cap. The green is its shadow. And reducible means that there's this disc here and I could surgery it. I can surgery the cap along this brown disc here. And that's gonna give me two simpler plumbing caps. Simpler meaning they hit the knot fewer times. And, and so I prove that if you've got two spanning surfaces that are related by a sequence of replumbing moves. So remember replumbing move means you take your plumbing shadow, the green, and you replace it with the plumbing cap, the purple. If there's a sequence of these moves taking F to F prime, then there's a sequence of moves taking F to F prime, replumbing moves, such that they're all nice. There's, they're all irreducible, so this doesn't show up and they're all acceptable. Okay, so what's the point? Well, then I can show that if you have your chessboard surface from an alternating diagram, reduced alternating diagram, then any irreducible plumbing cap, once you put it in a certain standard position, which I won't go into detail about, once you put it into a standard position, then it always looks in a very, it always looks exactly like this. And the point is that this is actually quite similar to what happens when we do a flight move. Because what's a flight move look like? Well, it comes from this situation. And so the point is that this thing that's happening right here, diagrammatically is the same thing that's happening right there. And it's a pretty simple innermost uh, disc argument. An innermost disc is gonna look like one of these. And then um, either you're done or this thing happens right here that's gonna cause you to have a reducible plumbing cap. Okay, so chessboard surfaces from alternating diagrams, the only, from reduced alternating diagrams, the only plumbing caps that they admit the only acceptable, irreducible plumbing caps, they admit, look exactly like this. And then this allows uh, a correspondence between flight moves and these apparent plumbing caps. Okay, so if you have a flight move, and as I just said, your flight move has this diagrammatic situation, which corresponds exactly to an apparent plumbing cap. So if you have a flight move and V is the apparent plumbing cap, and let's say it's a plumbing cap for the black surface, then when you replumb the black surface along that plumbing cap, the resulting surface is isotopic to the black surface from the resulting diagram. And the white surfaces are isotopic. In other words, a flight move gives you a replumbing of one, uh, chessboard surface and an isotopy of the other one. And this right here is probably the single most important um, insight behind this proof. Okay, so here on the, in the bottom row, you can see the flight. 
um, at least from here to here, you can see the flipe. And what happens in the middle is I've done a replumbing move. And the replumbing move is I replace this green disc right here with another disc, which I drew half in yellow, half in blue. So the yellow half is above, the blue half is below, and they're glued along this arc. And so the union of those two discs is the same, sorry, the boundary of the union of those two discs is the same as the boundary of this green disc, replacing the green with this disc right here is a replumbing move. And then when you do this isotopy, this weird looking disc here actually gets flattened out um, and looks like that. And so the insight is that this replumbing move or any other replumbing move corresponds to this flight move corresponds to a replumbing. Okay, and then we can put this together to say that flight related diagrams are the same as diagrams whose black surfaces are flight are replumbing related and whose white surfaces are replumbing related. And this follows immediately from the observation on the last slide. Uh, you just put these together in sequence. And the one thing that I want to point out here is, okay, you've got some diagram with a black surface and a white surface. You've got another diagram with another black surface and another white surface. And you can get from one to the other by a sequence of flight moves such that in the middle, you have a diagram whose black surface is the same as your ending diagram and whose white surface is the same as your starting diagram. And furthermore, for, this for, for the entire first part of the sequence, your white surface is unchanged except by isotopy. And for the last part of the sequence, your black surface is unchanged except by isotopy. Okay, so this is half of the proof of the flyping theorem is that flipes correspond to replumbing moves. So if we can show that the replumbing move, that the black surfaces are related by replumbing moves and so are the white surfaces, then we know the diagrams are related. So how is the proof of the flyping theorem gonna go? Well, this one we already proved. This one is what's next. And now I wanna tell you how the flipping theorem will follow from that theorem. So what's the theorem gonna say? It's gonna say that if you have any positive definite surface that's essential, then it's related to any other positive definite surface that's essential, that spans the same length. And it's related by isotopy and replumbing moves. Okay, so they are related according to this theorem. And the first theorem says, if they're related, then the diagrams are flight related. And so it immediately follows that any reduced alternating diagrams are related by flips. Um, okay, so how are we going to prove this? I won't go into too much detail, um, but I'll tell you the overall setup is to use Manasco's crossing ball structures. And this is a way to take a diagram and realize it geometrically by inserting a tiny crossing ball at each crossing and perturbing the link so that it sits on the boundary of the crossing ball. And then you can make combinatorial arguments by, okay, you thicken up the knot and then you cut out that thickened up knot and the crossing balls from space and you're left with an upper hemisphere and a lower hemisphere. The boundary of the upper hemisphere is a two sphere that looks like this near a crossing. And the boundary of the lower hemisphere is a two sphere that looks like that near each crossing. And so the game is, okay, we've got an arbitrary essential positive definite surface. And we wanna prove that we can transform it to our favorite positive definite surface, say the chessboard surface from this diagram, the positive one, by replumbing moves and isotopy. So how are we gonna do that? Well, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do isotopy to put F in a certain standard position. And the game is, how are you gonna define the standard position to your advantage? So yeah, you wanna minimize intersections between certain things, um, but there's a lot of choices that you can make on this. And, and so the key to this was setting up exactly the right kind of standard position. And once you set that up, you're gonna look at innermost circles where your surface intersects one of these two spheres. And that innermost circle is gonna give you some sort of move. 
Okay, so as an example of how this is going to look, <clears throat> here's kind of a typical picture. This, so what's going on in this picture here is we've got a spanning surface. The red and the blue are the boundary of the spanning surface, where the red is on the near side of the knot and the blue is on the far side of the knot. The purple is where the surface intersects the projection plane. And in this example, the surface is mostly disjoint from the, from the crossings, except at this one crossing right here. At that crossing, it actually passes through in two of these saddle disks. And you'll notice actually that this is not an alternating diagram. It's an almost alternating diagram. And all the weird stuff seems to happen at the non-alternating crossing, the D-alternator. So how, and interestingly in this example, um, it turns out that this is actually a picture of two Mobius bands, a disjoint union of two Mobius bands spanning this link. And I've, I've drawn this here. Uh, I've drawn them in, yeah, in, in green and brown so that you can see that there are actually uh, two disjoint surfaces. Um, so how's the argument going to go? Well, we're going to focus on how the surface intersects one of the two spheres. In other words, we're going to focus either on the near side, so that's the red together with the purple, and then when we do that, the point is we have a surface intersecting a two sphere, which generically is going to look like a collection of circles. And so we can pass to an innermost circle. Um, and so in this case, that might be enough. Um, and in general, uh, you can talk about a depth or a height of your circles. Um, and so the heights of these circles are captured by this graph right here. OK, so this is the idea. We'll put it in this kind of form. We'll look at an innermost circle. We'll use it to our advantage. All right, so I'm not going to go into the details of how I set up this standard position. But as a consequence, the first thing is that anywhere your surface intersects a crossing ball, it does it in one of two ways. Either a crossing band like this or a saddle like the kind we saw in the last figure. Now, in particular, I set up this standard position for this problem in such a way that all of the crossing bands are on the far side of the two sphere, like this or this, and they are disjoint from the near side. And the point is that if your surface, if your crossing band, so this green crossing band passing through this crossing, nearby, well, there's a disc coming up on the near side of the sphere. But the idea is that you can locally perturb it so that yeah, it'll still kind of come up near on the near side, but adjacent to the crossing band, it's going to be on the far side. And this is really the key, the key setup to the proof. And the point is that you get asymmetry with respect to the projection sphere. In other words, there's going to be more intersections on with the sphere on the far side. And the intersections on the near side aren't going to have anything to do with crossing bands. And what we want to do is we want to make our surface look like a chessboard surface. So we want crossing bands. Crossing bands are good. And so the point is that any circles coming from the disks on the near side have nothing to do with crossing bands. And so they're going to lead to bad things that we can get rid of. OK, so we want as many crossing bands as possible. And in particular, we don't want saddle disks, because if there's a saddle disk, there can't be a crossing band. So we're going to define the complexity of our surface within this structure to be the number of crossings that don't have crossing bands yet, plus the number of saddle disks. And we're going to put our surface in standard position, and we're going to minimize this complexity. All right, so how does the proof work? Well. You put it in a standard position, you minimize this complexity, you look for an innermost circle on the near side. And then you thicken up that circle and you modify it in a certain way and you get an annulus on the two sphere. And you, you can show using the definite intersection lemma that I mentioned earlier, that there's actually very few possibilities for how this annulus looks 
um, kind of in little in its in in its little pieces. And so you can take this annulus and cut it up into rectangles in a certain way, and then thicken those rectangles up in the direction of projection. And it turns out that they always have one of these three appearances. And then what you can do is you can, there's now a replumbing move that uses this innermost circle. And I know that it's probably impossible to read this off of this figure here um, right now. I, but um, the point is that the innermost circle gives you a replumbing move. And the replumbing move is either going to give you an extra crossing band, or it's going to remove a saddle disc. Therefore, this replumbing move decreases the complexity. And so then you can repeat the process until the complexity is zero. So what does it mean if the complexity is zero? It means that every crossing has a crossing band. We also know that, and so, so it follows that your surface is a state surface, if you know what this means. And then it turns out that actually your surface at this point has to be the black checkerboard surface, again, using the definite intersection lemma. And the point is that if, um, if there were ever a crossing uh, where it had, where it looked like the white surface instead, then you would have um, the wrong type of intersection with the white surface uh, near that crossing. Okay, so what have we done? We proved that flips correspond to replumbing moves, and we proved that all essential positive definite surfaces are related by replumbing moves, and likewise for negative definite surfaces. And it immediately follows uh, that the flipping theorem holds. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the flipping theorem implies that all reduced alternating diagrams of the same knot have the same writhe and have the same number of crossings, but it does not follow that the number of crossings from these diagrams is the crossing number of the knot. Because to prove that, you need to consider what if there was a non-alternating diagram of this knot with fewer crossings. Okay, so that problem remains open. Given in time, so we we know we know it's true as I described at the very beginning. Describe um, using the Jones polynomial. Um, in fact, reduced alternating knot diagrams do realize crossing number. But this is the remaining part of Tate's conjectures that has not been proven geometrically, and there are related open problems. So the first is, let's change alternating knot diagram to alternating tangle diagram, and here we need the tangle diagram to be reduced, which not only means that there's no kinks, it also means that there's no, all right, so if this is the, it means that there's no crossings that are directly parallel um, to the boundary uh, of the tangle. Because if this was the case, I could just push that crossing right out the boundary. And so this is a, over here an example of, a reduced alternating tangle diagram. Um, and the reason why this, this minimizes crossings as Thistlethwaite proved, I think in 1991, is you can reflect this across, um, you, can, you can think of this as a tangle in the three ball and you can reflect that three ball across its boundary two sphere. And when you do that, um, what you get is the following. Now this is not alternating. However, it is adequate. And what adequate means is that if you take the all A smoothing, which let's see is, well, inside the tangle, it kind of looks like this, which seems nice. And outside the tangle, it looks like this. So far, it seems kind of like a chessboard surface. 
But in the non-alternating part of the diagram, it's a little bit weirder. So first I'll do one more circle. This is also all good. But the non-alternating part is a little bit weirder. And adequate means that none of these circles from the all A state join each other, are adjacent to themselves at a crossing. And likewise for the all B state. The all B state also no circle is adjacent to itself at a crossing. And the same proof uh, that shows that alternating diagrams, reduced alternating diagrams, minimize crossings, that same proof shows that adequate diagrams minimize crossings. OK, so, so the point is that if you have an, a reduced alternating tangle diagram, you can reflect it. You get an adequate knot diagram. And using the Jones polynomial, you can prove that the adequate knot diagram realizes its crossing number. And that implies that the tangle diagram also realizes its crossing number. And the question is, how can you prove these by purely geometric means? And the goal is not just to avoid the Jones polynomial, but actually to understand the geometric content to it, that maybe there's a way to understand what's going on here in terms of spanning surfaces. So I want to close. Um, again, here's a summary of the three problems from the last slide. So one approach uh, in, in the spirit of this talk is to translate statements about diagrams into statements about chessboard surfaces, uh, like what Howie and Green did. So Howie, uh, to remind you, says that a knot is alternating if it has two spanning surfaces that satisfy uh, this combinatorial condition. And well, you can do the same type of thing in general for, an, for any diagram. You can say, well, a diagram comes from a pair of spanning surfaces that intersect each other in arcs. And you have to put a condition on the signs of the endpoints of the, those arcs. Each um, arc, the signs need to be the same, although they don't need to be uniform as they are in, in the alternating case. Um, and then the extra condition is, OK, you've got spanning surfaces that intersect along the right kind of arcs. And then you put the same type of, uh, this is really an Euler, character, er, Euler characteristic condition. And what you would do is you would replace this right here with twice the number of uh, arcs of intersection between the surfaces. So that's what, that's what a pair of chessboard surfaces are once they're in position. And so um, in order to try to attack this problem using spanning surfaces and chessboard surfaces, uh, what I'd like to understand is, OK, given a surface, any, any chessboard surface, any spanning surface, I want to know, can it be realized as a chessboard surface? And what's its complementary chessboard surface going to look like? And how are they going to have to intersect? Also, given a pair of spanning surfaces, can that pair be realized as a pair of chessboard surfaces from some diagram? And as far as I can tell, this question is completely open. Now, an alternative approach, which is related to this, is to focus on the arcs of intersection between the spanning surfaces. And those arcs happen to be at the crossings. Now, the Fleiping theorem says, suggests the following, is that maybe, well, Let's not just think about those arcs coming from the crossings from a given diagram, but maybe extend the set of arcs to a collection of arcs that give all crossings for all possible reduced alternating diagrams. And so in this example, here's a diagram of the 6-3 knot. And there are six vertical crossing arcs drawn in together with two weird looking arcs. And notice that the orange one has a, has a partner and the red one has a partner. And right here, this is a flight move. And what this does is it exchanges the red arc with the other red arc. And so now this weird looking red arc becomes a vertical crossing. And the vertical crossing becomes the weird looking one. And so in fact, uh, you can look at, given an alternating diagram, you can construct a spatial graph like this. And the symmetries of that spatial graph correspond to the symmetries of the knot. And so perhaps by unpacking um, what's going on here with these spatial graphs, 
uh, this is another possible approach uh, to these, to geometric approaches to Tate's conjectures and related problems. Thank you for your attention and thank you again uh, for the invitation to speak. Let me uh, conclude by uh, showing you my references. And once again, thank you.